why church giving is up, but pastor morale is down. We're talking about that today on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and A.J. Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, A.J. Matthew. AJ, welcome to episode 219 of the Church 219, Scott. Podcast. Yeah. They're stacking Can up. You believe it. We've been at this a long time, my friend. And <laughs> um, we've we've uh, covered a lot of data over the course of our 219 episodes of the podcast. Um, some things good, some things bad. And in this particular episode, we have both. We have some good positive data and some negative kind of shocking data i would say actually um and we're going to explore this contrast it's this real juxtaposition that um there was a uh, hartford institute for religion research which has been tracking some changes since the pandemic um and what they're finding is that a lot of things have bounced back attendance has is still short of pre-pandemic levels, but is is bouncing back. We're going to talk more about attendance actually in next week's episode, but um, so we're not going to hover there. But things like giving actually exceed pre-pandemic levels. They never really dropped off that much anyway, and they're actually we'll we'll, we'll go into detail here in a minute. But they're, they're things are going really well. There are there are a lot of indicators, AJ, that are positive. Yeah. Um, and yet despite that. The number of pastors thinking about quitting isn't just up, kind of. It's up a lot um, since 2020. I, I, it's not what I would have thought, AJ. I would have thought that, that that 2021 or so was maybe peak of that. And now maybe now things have sort of normalized down. Yeah. That is not true. It is yeah. it's worse than it's ever been. So we're exploring that today. The reasons why and how we can get out of that. Yeah. We don't, and yeah, and we don't, we didn't mix in any of this data, but from what, from what I recall seeing over the last year or so, I believe uh, the age, the median age of pastors continues to increase. Um, yeah. We've continued to have a decrease in the number of younger people getting into um, pastoral ministry. So overall, yep. yes, it, it, things are not looking good for the future and there's not any projections um, in anything that we're talking about today that says like, how bad is this going to get and when, but uh -huh. the writing's on the wall um, with, you know, if, if the age of pastors is increasing and more of them are thinking about leaving and we don't have the, uh, the younger um, generation filling that funnel, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to look forward a little bit and say, well, what's the condition of the church and leadership going to be in um, mm -hmm. a few years or many years from now? Yeah. Yeah. So let's dive into this data a little bit, because uh, this, again, it's a um, research from the Hartford Institute for Religion Research. Um, data comes from them, and there's uh, a few facts and figures. So let's let's start with attendance and giving, which is a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, so on the attendance, and again, we're going to talk more about decline reasons for decline in next week's episode. So stay tuned for that one. Um, but just to touch on it here, um, congregations in spring 2023, the, the median attendance um, was at 60, which is 9% decline from 2020, which was 65. But if you were to look at that over, um, and, and if you go to malfersgroup.com forward slash 219, I'll include the chart in here, AJ. Um, but this is back up. So the median church size decreased down, I think, at its lowest point was 50 something, uh, 45. Yeah. Um, so uh, relative to, to then, I guess it's an increase, but relative to pre pandemic levels, it, we're still at a at a 9% decrease compared to 2020. Um, but giving AJ, it's a different story. Things are better than ever right yeah yep yeah. yeah financial is on the upswing so 
Um, and that's also an interesting chart. So alfredgroup.com slash 219 that uh, showing that that financial chart. I was surprised by that in, in 2021. I was surprised when we were looking at those numbers like, wow, the uh, the 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 committed people in the church helped keep the church going in that in the most significant downturn that we've experienced in the church mm-hmm. in our lifetime. Um, yeah. Financially, it was it was off, but it did not match the the attendance decline. And we, I don't know that we've ever necessarily talked about or done an episode just on that either. That's that to me was an interesting phenomenon. And, um, and one, uh, you know, I, I would imagine was <clears throat> probably at least in retrospect was surprising to a lot of pastors as well. Um, that, wow, we didn't really, we did cause it was looking like the sky was falling in mm-hmm. s- early summer of 2020. Um, cause yeah. I think everybody expected the money to follow the people. If we're not there right. on Sunday, neither is our cash. And that wasn't the case. Um, certainly was for some, but uh, there, it, it indicated a, uh, a segment of the church population that was committed to supporting the church and making sure that it was going to maintain and then recover, uh, which is a huge blessing. Um, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, we're all thankful for, for those that that helped make that happen uh but it's continued to go back up from, from yeah here's minor here's something interesting i think for those of us uh aj you and i both live in in the let's say we both live in the south um you live in texas i live in tennessee both the south generally um although not obviously not the same cultures here but for for you and i i think when we think about the pandemic era, we we mostly think of that acute, you know, nine week span or so from March through summer of 2020. Yeah. And then for, for for you and where you live and me and where I live, things went back. I don't want to say to normal, but they went back to some degree of normal. Yeah. Uh, pretty quickly. Right. Um, but for in the data proves this out the 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 real uh acute challenges from the pandemic culminated really in 2021 and i mean you can it's i know it's so hard cuz it's like trauma so we don't really want to think about it but we can go back and think about what all of that was like in 2021 with resurgence and people went that's when mask mandates really came it really came in later it came in like fall 2020 early 2021 yeah um when the biden administration came in they really they really hammered hard the mask mandates and things like that and so if you follow the data the biggest dips were actually in 2021 not in 2020 which is interesting um so i don't know i just think it's interesting because that wasn't our experience where you and I live, but yeah, if right. You, if you take all of the United States into account, maybe the most acute season of this was was then. Um, uh, at, at any rate, to your point, though, I think one of the reasons why and what the data proves out, one of the reasons why giving remains strong and remains strong, is the. Uh, prevalence of online giving i mean that saved a lot of churches because people just moved to online giving um yeah. and this proves out what you and i have been saying about online giving and many others have been saying about online giving for years prior to the uh the pandemic which is of course it makes people more more regular givers of course it does because it's automatic i mean even if you have someone who is a really committed giver but they accidentally miss one month or two months out of out of twelve, you're obviously ahead with online giving because they don't ever miss. Yeah, I'm sure that's what supported a lot of that. Yeah, um, the the regular, yeah, the the automated giving. Nobody was like, "Well, I'm not coming, so let me go. Let me log back in and turn this off." I don't think anybody did that. No one did uh, that. So having having the automated giving in place ahead of the pandemic probably helped sustain financially through the pandemic. It absolutely helped through the pandemic. And so churches were smart. Most of them made this switch at the very beginning. It was smart for them to do it. 
it it saved their bacon literally. Um, and uh, the the data here is pretty interesting. So um, uh, the rise in church donations uh, has been fueled largely by by online giving. Um, robust online giving options reported higher per capita giving, with figures reaching as high as twenty twenty four hundred. Um, compared to 1,800 in in churches without such options. So think about that. Mm. There's a there's a $600 difference in per person giving uh, when you have online giving versus yeah. when you don't. Man, like that's that's significant. Yeah, for sure. I mean, do that math on whatever. Again, these are averages, but if you were to do some rough math in your church, if you don't have online giving now, you multiply your congregation times six hundred six hundred dollars. That's a lot of money that you're you're probably. I don't know. We were not about money, but you you have to think resources fuel ministry. You know, yeah. and, and to to not have that option available to your folks, you're what kind of ministry are you missing out on? Yeah, um, because you don't have those resources. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so there you go. I mean, that was that's kind of the foundation of what we're talking about today is that giving is up, but that's only half the story that we're telling today. And that is that. Oh, one other thing, AJ. Sorry, I want to mention this on positive trends. Positive trends. Um, uh, uh, volunteering is also bounced back up again, not to the same level as pre-pandemic, but um, we're we're like. At 23%, I think, is what the data shows. I misspoke. We're at 35% on average of a a percentage of the congregation who volunteers regularly, which is up from a 2021 low of 15%. But again, we're not back up to pre-pandemic levels, which was 45%. So we're not not quite all the way back when it comes to um, volunteer percentage, but we are... I didn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't absorb this chart. I got to put okay, you on the spot. Sorry. So, is the yeah. has the is it did volunteering and attendance is that a similar? If could you overlay those? Are they pretty similar? When attendance came back, so did volunteering. More or less, yeah. the The dips, the highs were higher, and the lows were lower when it comes okay. to volunteering. Okay. Versus attendance, yeah. So it's it it dipped lower. But it's also increased higher. Okay. Would be. All right. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're at uh, 35% of folks regularly volunteer versus a pre-pandemic 45%. So we're we're almost all the way back. Not quite. Yeah. And when we do, so in our church ministry analysis, we put down 50% volunteer as a rate. healthy target we'd a go okay target yeah which yeah, is yeah. A, a stretch goal from the average and presently today a little bit more of a stretch goal than it was pre-pandemic so that's right that's yeah. right so in terms of po- there's a lot of positive things to point at and say things are stabilizing at minimum uh-huh. or they are actually improving um when it comes to these sort of stable nickels and noses metrics compared to yeah. where things have and yeah. yet, there are some really negative numbers. So let's maybe explore those. Yeah. So let's shift into that. So yeah, at this point, we're like, "What's your problem? Look, things are things are <laughs> things fun. are better." What are, what are you about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, pastor dissatisfaction unfortunately has increased. So um, I don't know. I guess and so by a little. Yeah. By a lot. Yes. Uh, all right. So some of the hard numbers, 2021, 21% of pastors had thought about leaving the church. Uh, is Scott, is that our leaving pastoral their ministry altogether? No, no, their no. Church? that's just leaving their, their, their position church. at their church. Yeah. So 2021, 21%, 2023 numbers has gone from 21% up to 38%. Scott, that's in three years. That's a huge jump. Two years. 17 Two years, two a seventeen percent increase. Um, twenty nine percent of that of that number thinking about it often, leaving. Um. Oh, okay. Then yes. Yeah, no, so no, no. Leaving. I believe that that's twenty nine percent. 
of all pastors. Oh, total 29%. Think yeah, about yeah, it often. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 38% have thought about leaving their church. 29% often think about leaving their church. Um, all right. So then the hard numbers on leaving ministry altogether, 38% had considered leaving ministry altogether back in 2021. Um, now 51% are thinking that way. That over half, over, over half, half of, pastors. of pastors have thought about leaving pastoral ministry altogether. That's yeah, alarming. Thirty four percent, so more than a third, um, consider it often. Yeah, imagine, imagine if fifty one percent of pastors executed on this thought next week. If we, if next week we lost fifty one percent of the pastors in America, what would? What would that look like culturally inside and outside the church? AJ, that means that if if these, uh, you know, if these statistics rarely prove out with like the exact number of people that you're, you're listening. But I mean, just imagine that's essentially saying that half of the people who are listening to this podcast right now who are in ministry are, have considered leaving ministry and, 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 one out of three of them uh, listening to this podcast right now think about it a lot. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, you, you might be, you're sitting in the car right now listening to this podcast and that might be you. And yeah. um, I would love to get real feedback from our listeners on that. A podcast is a horrible medium in which to interact with your audience. So yeah, you cannot click comment on, on this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can comment right there. Otherwise, you can email us leadership at malfortgroup.com. If you have thoughts on this, you're like, yeah, I, I'm one of those 51%. I would love to hear why. Um, you know, we're not going to use your name. We're not going <laughs> to say okay, yeah, we're not going to put Pastor we're not going to email your congregation. Smith. Yeah, uh, John just said, I mean, he's thinking about leaving. <laughs> uh, but I mean, for Scott and I, you know, I mean, we're we're this is just a space in which we we are involved in work. Uh, would love to get some real real feedback from any of you who have that uh, that thought. Um, why why is that? What's what's making you think that way? And um, where do you think you would go? What would you do if you weren't going to be in pastoral ministry? That would be an interesting thing to find out too. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the data, Scott, though really is alarming um when you've got it is alarming. half of pastors thinking maybe i'm done with ministry yeah. or they've entertained that thought yeah and when especially when you stack on top of that aj what you mentioned that that it's not like there's this huge pipeline of of young leaders ready to step into these roles i have right. been sounding the alarm bell on this I feel like for your certain from before the pandemic, certainly of this is my biggest fear. And it's the number one thing that motivates me in, in the work that we do is the reality that um, we're, we're, we are, we are barreling towards a leadership cliff in the church that there are, there are going to be way more churches who need leaders then there are leaders to fill those spots and and two things will happen well i guess three things there will be some lucky churches <laughs> who who snag some competent leaders to lead them and th- then they'll do well there'll be another third of churches that end up just having to close um because they can't get someone to fill that spot and so they'll combine with another church we're already starting to see this happen and there'll be another third of churches, AJ, that that just put in a warm body, and they're going to suffer the consequences of having a an unqualified leader in that slot, and that's going to do real damage because we see that all the time. Of you put someone who isn't qualified for this position in the role, and um, with devastating to devastating effects, and so I'm concerned about this, um, majorly concerned about this, AJ. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's making me just kind of think about my own, uh, like anecdotes that that in my own experience. So, the last for the last three summers, I've been a guest lecturer in, with Regent University's theology, their demon program. So, demon candidates anyway, not not going to be twenty five year olds. They're going to be a little bit older, um, 
but I'm just kind of thinking about these classes and the populations in them, and they have been older people, over 40. I would, I'm just kind of trying to think back, like on average, but they're over 40, maybe even, and many over 50. Um, so it's, you know, it's not been the younger crowd that, that has been working towards that level of, you know, education in theology and well, church. Part theology. of that is expense, right? Of I course. Mean, Again, yes, it's not typically your yeah. demon programs are not filled with 25 year olds that that are just like knocking out every level of education all at once. But yeah. uh, it's definitely, definitely an older group. I mean, because you're 25 year olds who would be they wanted to be in a demon program. They're carrying however many tens of thousands of dollars of yeah. their bachelor's yeah. debt and then right. however many tens of thousands of dollars from getting their MDiv. Uh, you know and they're still they're, thinking yeah i want to do student ministry for my entire uh, career they <laughs> yeah we're yeah now now they i haven't want to go out 40 yet, grand like, a year and i'm going to be paying off we haven't dealt with this i mean sorry yeah. now i feel like we're going on a sidetrack but this is important aj one of the reasons why we have to rethink theological education i certainly am not a fan i hope i've made that clear of unqualified people stepping into ministry, but we've got to totally reframe what does qualified look like. A master's degree in theology, you know, THM is a 90-hour program, AJ. Uh, a, a uh, No, it's 120 hours. It's 120 hours. Um, a An MDiv is a 90-hour program, and a master's, and just a regular master's, mine is a Master of Arts in Religion, that I got from Gordon Conwell. It's a it's a sixty hour program. By contrast, a a master a, a business degree, master of business, an MBA, um, is a like a thirty two or thirty six hour program. So your your lowest level of master's degree in in the theological space is almost double what is normal for a master's degree in a secular field and the gold standard mdiv is is you know three times as many credits and then the thm yeah. which really is like creme de la creme tip at the top like at like a dow seminary or something it's it, it's basically a whole nother four-year degree it's four it's another four-year degree and it's so expensive and i'm sorry i'm getting sidelined here but to me this is a real problem how in the world can we expect young people to want to saddle themselves with a hundred thousand dollars in seminary debt to go on and make fifty thousand dollars as a, I mean they'll never pay it, they'll just never pay it off. They'll just they'll be they're gonna be in debt for forever. And and then they're and then the, how are they gonna buy a house? And how are they going to have a family? And how, like when you look at all of that, why would you? Why would you get into it? And not because you don't love the Lord, and you're not. No one's getting into ministry because they're thinking they're going to get rich. There is not a single person, normatively, who is going into ministry thinking I'm going to make a lot of money. But it's not unreasonable to say, "Hey, I don't want to." Do I have to take a vow of poverty? And yeah. worse, worse than poverty, we're indebtedness. I'm 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 in debt. I'm a slave. I'm a I'm a I'm a slave. Yeah, this could definitely be a whole other episode because obviously just formal theological education. Tangent, this is a, this a is problem. A, it, it's a relatively modern thing, you know. I mean to to have have this anyway. So well, I mean not uh, really. I mean certainly seminaries have existed, but the the fact that seminary costs a hundred thousand dollars is new. Yeah, that wasn't true. Yeah. I mean the yeah the 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 levels of education the time it the time it takes yeah yeah for sure what are the, yeah what is the you know what is the cost benefit analysis on that and what's the way out so we need new ways to educate leaders so that they are competent and ready and not saddled with literally a lifetime of student loan debt yeah. Way off track now at this point. Except not. I mean, yes, it's off track from what's I've got in the article. But, 
But true. Now Maybe we're talking we, about why are all the reasons why people want to get out of this? Yeah, we may have just introduced. Yeah, another 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 reason uh, for this. We don't. Yeah, we don't have the data to support it, but it certainly wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that um, either either feeling pressure to increase education, seeing the time and expense for that, or having gone through that and now saddled with debt, w- which you're not going to see. You know, your church is going to be like, hey, we're going to give you a $20,000 raise because you just finished that demon. No, they're going to say, congratulations, you did what we feel like you should have already done. Way to go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Or when they hired you, it was like, okay, well, you have five years to, yeah, we we would prefer a higher level of education. And that's been a pressure point. Yeah. Go on most church listings. Most of them will say, we expect an MDiv. They will expect you to have, you will not be qualified for most senior pastor positions if you haven't already settled yourself with the cost of a 90 hour seminary degree. Yeah. I they're, not even, wonder, they're not even considering you. Yeah. I, and I, and I would also question what, what level of research or conversation did that search committee actually work through to come to the conclusion that that was the that should be the requirement so it depends well i mean it just depends i mean we really don't need to get sidetracked here but i mean it depending on the um, denomination an mdiv may be required for ordination itself um yeah yeah so it, it just depends on what your tradition is there um and at the same time i'm not saying hey just some schmo off the street <laughs> yeah. who has no training at all. Let's get them in there. Like there has to be just a, n- a new approach to thinking. About yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm not knocking and, and the benefits of the education and, and the value uh, by any means. I am knocking the value. There's no way. Oh, for, for the actual dollar value. Yes. I'm talking about the value dollar, yeah. in the value in, in preaching and leading and yeah. Understanding God's word and, the church and that's not just a seminary problem it's just a higher education problem in general there there's not a yeah, single degree sure. that is worth the sticker price it has gotten very very high yes no doubt about it okay so why are pay, why are pastors thing so financial financial stress might be on that list uh yeah. very likely on that list you inflation is through the roof and while giving may have gone up 40 percent in, in your church my guess is your salary hasn't. So, um, uh, you know, there there may be some real pressures, financial pressures, because there's not a single place on the planet that isn't suffering from high inflation. And that's not a uniquely American problem. That's everywhere. Um, and so that's creating a burden. Um, there's a burden of leadership uh, that's obvious that, you know, if you're listening to this in your in ministry you you're an administrator and you're a counselor and you're a community leader and you know you're you're sp- you're a spiritual guide you're you're supposed to be all of these things and then some uh, and then on top of all of that you know you've been thrown 18,000 changes over the course of the last couple of years and depending on your personality if you're wired like me I love change I'm I it's like throw me a new curveball I like I live I live for it, but most pastors aren't wired that way. AJ, most pastors are. We've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Are an S type leader. Change is difficult, and so you throw enough change at most pastors statistically, and it will break them. And that's what we're starting to see. I think is that there was maybe enough adrenaline, and I think that this is maybe is accounting for why we're seeing the increase now and not before. I think there was enough em- adrenaline and emotion in the crisis to go like, we've got to get through this. Um, and that now that s- some of that pressure has relieved, all of that, it's almost like an adrenaline dump where we're a withdrawal, where we're going, feeling depressed and going, oh, we were we were running at this level, and now we don't have to, and now we're feeling the effects of that. Huh, you think? And then instead of manifesting that in just a sense of relief, it's more like a sense of escape. Um, Want to just be done? It's yeah, not I mean, enough think just of, to level out and continue, but it's like I just got to get out of this altogether. Yeah, I mean, think think even about like 
I, I mean, I think there's a there's a percent there's a portion of this that is purely physiological, in the, that maybe a good comparison is like when you're exercising or when you're working out. When you when you are in the middle of a workout, like you are pushing hard and you are doing it, and you're maybe even feeling good, and it's hard and you're working up a sweat, and you, you know, like it isn't that there isn't pain, but you are doing a lot of heavy lifting. And then the irony is the next day after that hard workout, you can't even go down the stairs. Like <laughs> the day before you are grinding it out, you know, on, on a run or on the bike or whatever, and you're doing some real work. And then the next day you can't go up the stairs. And it's because you're you're in this recovery and your your muscles are broken down. And I think that, that a lot of leaders feel that way. They 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 flexed. It took every bit of leadership acumen they had to hold things together and now in the aftermath of that while things have somewhat stabilized there there's just this brokenness on the back end of that that they're you couldn't feel it because you were in the middle of it and now you're feeling it i think that there's definitely an aspect of it that's yeah 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 could be yeah i think part and part of that i mean you you mentioned in here also the emotional and spiritual toll. I mean, it's it's fairly common knowledge, the, uh, the feeling of isolation that a lot of pastors have. And so, again, to weather something, you know, a a months long, years long, uh, heavy impact in which you probably were fairly alone in it. Um, and now that let down as well, coming out of it still in relative isolation, not having close relationships or an output for counseling, anything like that. Um, yeah. That, that could be a part of it as well. No doubt. I mean, in the best of times, being a pastor is, is isolating. Like when things are going well, things are, it's, it's an isolating job because you can't trust anybody. Who At can a deep trust? level, it is on the surface level, surrounded by folks um, oh, with yeah, great yeah. adoration, but, Sometimes, I mean, less behind so. the scenes. But, yeah, I mean, it certainly yeah, are, I mean, could guess, be environments in which <laughs> it's hostile. It's openly hostile towards you, yeah. or yeah, indifferent. Yeah. Um, but I mean, many pastors in do enjoy surface level things. It, you know, an outside observer would go, "Wow, that looks really great," when in fact it's not. Yeah. Um, no, those folks yeah. who get in their cars and drive home on Sunday, and <laughs> you're not going to see them again. Right, right. They, and they don't necessarily care. No. So, yeah, I mean, it's isolating because you can't really, you can't trust people. You can't, you can't be really fully open with the people in your congregation because there's risk there. Yeah. You, if, even if you have elders, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we promote having an elder team is if it's a healthy situation and if you've structured it in a particular way and if you've built the team the right way, it can be really freeing to have a good elder team that loves you and cares about you and that you can be open with and that you can be transparent with without fear of, Oh, I'm going to get fired if I'm open about what's happening in my marriage or what's happening in my, you know, um, walk with the Lord. So in a healthy situation, that is the least isolating way to lead. But the, the reality is that most pastors are not in this situation. If they have an elder team, you know, there's, there's this, there's a, a sense of, I can't really, these people could fire me. So I can't really be honest with them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's isolating. Yeah. Um, I, I was talking to you, AJ, before we started recording about what it's even like to, to go into a grocery store. I mean, de- depending on the size of your church, even if you're not a, a big church, I mean, you often don't know who has attended your church in the past or maybe visited once or twice, and you just don't know that person. Um, plus, you don't know who is there all the time who might just be in the same grocery store as you. So just this sense of always being on in no matter where you go, because someone might see you and not that you would be doing anything wrong, but if your kids are with you, you want to be sure you're not fussing at them too much because people might go, oh, man, he can't. He he really lashed out at his kids at the, the grocery store or or be, but you also want to make sure the kids aren't too out of control because then they're gonna go, Oh, your kids are really you man, you can't keep uh yeah. keep the kids under the control in the grocery store. Like there isn't a moment where you can be off, and that is it's burdensome. If this podcast gets much more popular, we're gonna have to wear disguises. 
in the grocery store, Scott. <laughs> the problem, except that I don't care. <laughs> I'm probably not having any time soon. That's a joke. Yeah, that's a I've, joke. Grown to the, I've grown to the point where at this point in my life, I think I would be like, look, if it's not for Jesus, I'm screwed. And so your opinion of me is not going to move the needle. Like I, I already know I need Jesus. There's no opinion that you could have of me that is going to lessen or increase my need for Jesus. Here, here. All right. So some tips for improving morale. Um, not this is not these are not revolutionary. These are the same tips that we would have given five years ago. Um, the, but they're important and they're uh, they're sometimes not sought um, or worked towards. And none yeah. of them necessarily are also super easy or fast to fix either. Um, so, yeah, I mean, first of all, this relate. I mean, we just mentioned relationships, um, insecurity. Um, in who you can open up with the risk of being open with people um so i mean we have and continue to encourage outside relationships um being able to develop relationships with people outside of your church um because it it you can develop a safer space that way mm-hmm. to be more of who you are to talk about uh concerns and vulnerabilities uh but having having some and you don't need 15 people i mean i mean depending on your personality I wouldn't want 15 close friends. <laughs> no. One or two is good. Um, so I think yeah. I think maybe one of my favorite memes from recent years is like we're not talking about the real miracle of Jesus. Said he's a 30-year-old man with 12 friends. <laughs> How unlikely is that? <laughs> like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Uh, that was, yeah, that was quite the fraternity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but you know, I guess probably maybe the, the actual reality is that it's been more common to have like zero close friends. Um, mm. so yeah. yeah, that could be a whole other episode. I, and I don't think this is a uniquely pastor problem. I yeah. think it's acutely a problem if you're a pastor, but the problem of men having friends at least in the United States, I can't speak for other countries, but it's a real problem. Most men don't have friends. Um, and it, it shows. <laughs> Just yeah. I don't know. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people like me that don't necessarily have a strong sense of needing or wanting friendships or a lot of friendships. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm okay with just a couple of couple of relationships. Um, you know, I don't know if that, how much is that, is that unhealthy? You know, I mean, should, should we seek that more or, or not? Um, do we need more I don't friends? Know. Do we need better friends? I, don't know. I think, I don't know. This is a side topic. We should probably talk about it sometime in an episode, but um, I, I would say most people don't need a bunch of friends, you know, but um but more than zero and and maybe like you and i are very close friends yeah but we are we live a thousand miles from each other so the majority of our of our friendship apart from when we're working together and and that's fun but um you know it's 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 mostly uh zoom it's so weird like we've gotten so used to interacting this way on zoom yeah it doesn't feel strange, but like if I've got a, if I've got some mechanical problem with my car and I'm mechanically challenged, you can't help me with that because you live yep. a thousand miles away and you're yep. totally the person I would call to help me with that. We talk about it, but I can't go, I can't bring my tools over. And no, I would, you can't. that's, the, you that's the kind of, if you live next door, I would be helping you with stuff all the time because a, you would need me to and B, I would want to. So, right. Right. And, <laughs> and your son would be mowing my lawn. At a discount, <laughs> probably, hopefully, because uh, he's got a long uh, business. You know, you're always um, you, you you're always taller in person than I, I. It's not like we never see each other in person, but every time we do, ever see you, I'm like, oh yeah, Scott's taller than I than I think he is. You know, we look the same you know, height. On tell me, will you tell my wife that? 
She what does she think you're short? She doesn't think I'm as tall as I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the person that see she doesn't believe the number. Do you need to just get a tape correct. measure out and go look? Yeah, here? yeah. I, it yeah. matches my driver's license or what? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I am without shoes, without shoes on. I am 5'11 and a half. Like that is, that is my height. And that half is the most important part of that measurement. <laughs> right. So when, so with shoes on, I yeah. am, I'm six foot with shoes on. Yeah. Like I'm not lying. I'm not lying about my height. I'm not trying to say I'm taller than I am. I am, I'm not, a, I'm not a full six foot unless I'm wearing shoes. And Allison's like, you're not six foot tall. And I'm like, except, except that I am like, I, I, I can I, attest. Yeah. You're, you're taller. Than, I'm my driver's license says five ten. I'm not sure I'm actually five ten anymore. Um, but I'm somewhere in the neighborhood. Uh, you're yeah, yeah. you're taller than me. I think it's because I'm. I think it's because of how I'm built. Like I'm built like I should be shorter than I am. Because I'm I'm kind of like I'm like a broader shouldered guy. Like you would expect me to be maybe five ten. Yeah. But no, I'm five eleven and a half. Well, our Fijian I, friend suggested. Maybe you get into rugby, and that was. And he's a big dude. He's yeah, a big that's rugby true. Dude. He's like Scott. You might be a good rugby player. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The guy from Fiji said you should play rugby. I used to get told all the time, "Hey, you'd make a really good linebacker." I'm kind of built like that. Like I'm not fat, but I'm built like. Yeah, kind of like it. Really, it doesn't come off on Zoom. Uh, no, but you. But the point was, you and I spend a million hours a year together. On what was Zoom. the point of this? How are we? A few about times this? we see each other in person a year, and I'm always like. Dang, Scott's Scott's tall. Oh, that warms my heart because again, there are people in my life. I'll I'll just uh, tell you. Okay, look. So my father-in-law, he is taller than me, slightly. And so, so your wife. So what she's comes got the comparison into, against her dad? Well, what comes up in conversation is because we're talking. We talk about my son, how he's going to be tall. Yeah, they say, "Oh, you're going to be tall like." Like Poppy, like my uh, father-in-law. Yeah. And I go, you're getting past. And I, I'm looking at photos of, I'm looking at family photos and I'm like, look, look how we're the same. <laughs> look how the difference between me and him are. It's like, it's, it's negligible. We are approximately the same height. I hate to say it, but your lack of ability to fix the car might make your <laughs> wife see you as shorter. <laughs> <laughs> you're totally right yeah yeah if anything is broken i'm like ah, i'm just taking it into the shop what's wrong She's with like, it, it need, oh it yeah need, i need a my new husband's headlight. five six i forgot <laughs> <laughs> i'm not okay, handy, wow I'm this sorry. episode is so off off the rails okay number Tips one for- if you want to be happier in life you you need friends. You need people who can tell you, hey, you're taller than I thought you were. At least get you a Zoom buddy. Yeah, that's right. At least get you a Zoom buddy. And you can do that. You can do that by joining pastors groups. If you're in a non-denominational, join a network. Join a network of pastors. Join a pastors group. Um, your local area, if you're in a non-denominational church, um, but you are, let's say, Baptist adjacent, like you aren't Baptist, but you are Baptist adjacent, I promise you, if you live in the United States, there is a Baptist association near you. And I've worked with a lot of these associations. They will accept you. They have, they always have a pastor's group. They have like pastor's lunch or whatever. And yeah, some of them are dorks. I mean, some of the pastors might be total weirdos, but a lot of them are, are not. They're just normal guys. They're doing good work and they will accept you. What, even though you're not a part of their association, I, I promise you. And they won't ask you for money. These these are good guys. They're good hearted folks. If you say, I listen, I need an I need I need pastor friends that I can count on, I promise you they will let you come to their pastor lunch that they do once a month and just start making friends. And I know how hard that is. I know I've been there myself. It's like ugh, the the thought of going into a room with a bunch of pastors um when you're a pastor. It can feel competitive. It can also be like, who, which one of these people is going to be strange? Like, I get it. I, I'm just being honest, AJ. I've, I've been to these kinds of meetings as a pastor, and sometimes yeah. you're like, some of these people I'm not going to get along with. I'm going to have nothing in common with. But that's a dumb reason not to go because y- you might meet your best friend. 
at one of these places. Uh, that's the world anyway. I mean, you, we're not built to get along with everybody. We have, yeah. yeah. So this put yourself out there. Group. You got to be a friend to make a friend. And and all of those guys who are at a pastor's meeting, they're experiencing the exact same thing you are. They're feeling the same way that you are. So go make a friend and you don't have really any excuse because if you are remotely Baptist adjacent, I promise you those Baptists will accept you into their group. They will. They won't turn. They may not invite you to preach, but you don't need to do that. Probably won't. And they may ask you for a donation (laughs) at some point along the way, but they will let you come to their meeting. All right. Uh, The the next one is getting outside leadership help. Um, Because uh, again, leadership is a lot of times isolating and it's also sometimes myopic uh, because you're dealing with the same people all the time, the same situations or problems. You're not able to move past things sometimes. I mean, one of the most common things that we hear as outside support mechanisms for churches is that I've been saying, you know, the pastor's like, I've been saying the same thing that you're saying. It hasn't been landing. They're not really listening. Mm-hmm. They're not responding to me. Um, so, uh, you know, whether it's us or or other other outside organizations or individuals that might be able to help you, um, you know, that can be something. Maybe if there's something that feels like, you've not been able to make improvement in, and that is leading to this sense that maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Maybe I don't even want to be in this space. Perhaps somebody coming alongside you could help move past a hurdle um, to a little bit more open running space on the track for you. And yeah. uh, and that might that might at least in a short or, or intermediate term um, help alleviate a pressure point that might be driving you towards leaving the ministry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, AJ and I, when we talk to, you can always count on us to to be safe people. You know, if you, if you come to us and you go, hey, I'm really struggling with this, we're not going to be like, but we'll tell you the truth. We'll be like, oh, yeah, that is a problem. Or um, I've had meetings with pastors where I go, I think you're overblowing this. Like, I, I think you're not seeing this clearly. We'll tell you that. Um, uh, but sometimes you just need a sounding board. Sometimes you need, like you were just saying, AJ, for someone to come in and say the exact same thing you've been saying. Um, and so we, we, we get a lot of joy out of being moral support, uh, yeah. for, for pastors. We're on your team. And unless you're really, I can only think of a very couple of situations where we didn't have a good relationship with the pastor in a particular situation. And that was never because we didn't want a good one. Um, I don't know. I can think of a couple instances, but we're on our predisposition is to be on your team, I guess would be. We always assume we're on your team. What do you need? How can we help you? How can we serve you? We are not ad- adversarial to, to you, but our commitments to the Great Commission. So if we if you start going, well, I want to do this thing that's not in alignment with the Lord. Then we might have a challenge, but it, 99 out of 100 of you, that's what you want too. And so we're, we're on your team. We want to help you. Um, and so, yeah, get, getting some outside help from us or from someone else is, is often a great way to improve morale for you. And then the last tip um, is just kind of some general self-care, which is also kind of buzzy. It's because everybody. I, I was like, really hoping that you wouldn't say that wouldn't word. Call it that. <laughs> yeah. But I would say I we care have, for yourself uh, like instead a, of self-care. I think uh, that's like it's like new agey. It's almost like a cult. It is. It's also very self-centered. I think the, yeah. the current use of it is it's all about you and you should do whatever you want, regardless, whatever makes you happy. And that's obviously not what we're talking about on the Church Revitalization podcast. Um, but general things that help you to be well adjusted and to be in a in a healthy state in which to care for others because that is your primary role in life in your occupation. Um, but I, I put it in the to, article. I labeled it "Take care of yourself." Right. Like, yeah, treat yourself with respect so that you can do the things that you want to do. I think a good. I think about like these. Um, I was watching a video the other day, AJ, about the, uh, I'm a big Cowboys fan for, you know this, AJ, but for for listener who maybe doesn't know this, I was watching a, um, uh, like a little clip talking about the Dallas Cowboys um, nutritionists in the, 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 like cafe that they have there, cafeteria. 
And um, the players and coaches and different folks can put in requests for like certain types of food that they want. And then the nutritionists will kind of take a look at what's in that food or in that recipe. And then they might make recommendations on, hey, let's use this ingredient instead of that ingredient. Let's use this spice instead of that spice because this spice improves, you know, muscle repair. And this one boosts metabolism or or, or whatever it might be. And um, the reason why they take go through all this trouble is so that on Sunday when they hit the field, their body is at peak performance. It isn't just to make the players feel happy, although I'm sure they would like for the players to be happy and they would like for the players to enjoy what they're eating. The reason why they put all the effort into that is so that their bodies will be at optimal performance. And so I think to translate that to the ministry space, it's like the point of Sabbath, and Jesus says this, Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Like the, the reason why Sabbath exists is is for you to rest. The reason why you need family time is for your family to be healthy. The reason why you need to eat well is so that your body will be healthy. The reason why you need to move your body is so that your body will be healthy. So that you can do the work of ministry. What good are you to your church if your body is falling apart, your family is falling apart, and you're exhausted? You are of no use. And so if you want to be fruitful and you want to be faithful, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. That's it's, not selfish to me. That to me, yeah. that is not being selfish. It's the opposite of being selfish. We are, it's very God made us very interesting creatures, very interesting creations. We spend a third of our life sleeping, unconscious to the world by mm. necessity. We have to eat constantly. I mean, I was just posing this the other day, trying to make fun conversation with my wife. How different would the existence of humanity be if we only had to eat once a month? You know, like you, you have a meal. Because like, it oh, could yeah. be that way. Like there are some creatures where this is the case, right? Yeah. Some I mean, animals don't, we have they eat huge once a month. spaces in our houses built around preparing and consuming food. We have industries around the consumption and preparation of food, you know, the growing of food. And, and all, I mean, it's all, about, it's all about the food. We have to eat every day, multiple times. We have to sleep constantly. But we rebel against that, and we're like, I can miss this meal for that meeting. I can stay up later to do work. I can not take days off for weeks or months at a time to do more. You know, I mean, we rebel against. Perhaps I don't know. I'm just this is just stream of consciousness happening now. We rebel against the created order in order mm -hmm. to do more for ourselves or what we perceive others need or require of us. Um you know, just on this different level. Like we don't, we don't yeah. consciously say, I'm going to stop sleeping every day. I'm only going to sleep once a week so that I can do more yeah. ministry, but yeah. we will stay up late. We will miss a meal. Um, <clears throat> we, we will do unhealthy practices to the level in which we can push ourselves um, without stopping to go, wait a minute. There's there, there is an order to this. There is a health aspect that, is in our design and our DNA by the by the one who created us. Um, yeah. And so we will sacrifice things in order to do more of what we think we need to do for ourselves or others. This is a really good point, AJ. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about this. It's really, it's a really good point. I mean, there are some, I mentioned, there are some animals that only need to eat once a month. You know, they eat a big meal, takes them a while. And then they're digesting that thing for a month. Yeah. If you got a, uh, do you know how? Do you know how much you can go on vacation and give them a mouse, and they're they're fine so. and they're good. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how? Do you know how much giraffes sleep per day? How much does a giraffe sleep per? I don't know if I've ever seen a sleeping giraffe. So is it a little or is it a lot? I don't know. Between thirty and forty minutes. Wow. A day. Boy, that's it. That's all they need. Man. Um. And so, uh, to your point, God could have designed humans to only need to eat once a month, and they only need to sleep 30 to 40 minutes a day. Yeah. But he didn't. You know, there, there, there are animals that eat more and sleep more than humans, for sure. But he, he designed us to sleep a particular amount an optimal amount and to eat an optimal amount. 
And when you, you're right, when you are, when you are intentionally going against, I'm not talking about a fast for a particular reason. I'm, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm, I'm talking about when you are intentionally lifestyle. Like, oh, yeah. I can just go, I can go on empty. It's rebelling against your nature. Um, in, unless there's some intentionality behind a fast, just skipping meals, just to skip meals because you're too busy. That's not, that isn't a fast. That's, that's just foolishness. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, you're right. I, I like what you said. It's, it's, we're made the way we are for a reason. It's too bad. Everybody's turned this off by that by now. They missed, I hope not. They missed I hope not. the golden nugget at the end. <laughs> Okay, so to wrap this up, um, this episode that when we started, I said, ah, I bet this won't be long. It's been really long. Um, there are things in in churches that are rebounding or improving, uh, and yet the morale for pastors is not one of those things. In fact, it's, it's not just worse, it's way worse. And so uh, our encouragement to you, if you find yourself in that category of, of a pastor who is considering leaving, um, First, I just want to say it breaks my heart to hear that. Um, yeah. But also, I understand. I know why you feel the way you do. I've been where you're at, and I have felt what you have felt. Um, and I I don't want you to stay that way. So make friends. And 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 the onus is on you. I mean, I think lots of times we feel like, well, someone needs to make friends with me. No, you. You go make a friend. You can make that choice. And my first step would be, if you're not a part of a denomination right now, go to the Baptists. They will, they will embrace you. Um, two, get some outside help with, as it relates to your church. Like if you've been fighting some of the same battles for a long time, get an advocate, get someone who can help advocate with you and for you. Um, and that could be us or that could be someone else. And three, just take care of yourself. Your body needs sleep. Your body needs rest. Your body needs food that has real calories in it and not just junk. Uh, and you need your family needs you. You think about this, AJ. It's our last point. You if you can shortchange your family only so long, and then that can break your family. And if you break your family, you're going to lose your ministry too. So your your ministry needs you to have a healthy family, or yep. you'll lose your ministry. So it's not wasted time. Uh, it's really important. There you go. Well, this has been episode 219 of the Church Revitalization Podcast. So if you go over to malfersgroup.com slash 219, you can read today's article. While you're there, click on the donate button up there and support the global ministry of the Malfers Group. And with that, go uh, have a nap, have a sandwich, call your friend, tell them you're excited. Drink some water. <laughs> and we'll be back with you next week. <laughs>